One question is uh, in Sunan Abu Daoud uh, 4,449, I believe, where it says that I believe in you and yes. the one who revealed you. Uh, some Muslims like to say that that hadith is daif because there's a <laughs> like the chain of narration is uh, daif. Daif. Who said it's daif when it even tells you it's it's <clears throat> it's that no because it says it says like Hassan. Yes. But the chain of narration is daif. So now let's let's follow the genius of these Muslims because I'm going to show you this is one of the arguments that Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya used. Number one, daif means it passed. That's not my opinion. He can go right now on YouTube, put in Hamza Yusuf, Daif. Daif means it passed. You can't reject it. Some Muslims will say you can use Daif hadith to encourage good behavior, but you can't use Daif hadith for legal matters. So even if it's Daif, that doesn't prove anything. Number two, this very hadith was used by a group of Muslims to show the Torah cannot be corrupted. So they, they did not know the classification of hadith. So are uh, they telling me? Well, which Muslims? Uh, my pleasure. The ones that mentioned by Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya. Here, let me show it to you. My pleasure, brother. So, number one, who told you the Daif is rejected? I always who? hear it from uh, uh, like Muslim apologists saying uh, Daif, you have to. Yeah, but I, I'll tell them, who told you Daif is rejected? Okay, it's Daif. It means it passed. It is not forged. You can't say it's a forgery. It is weak in its chain, but it's still. Something we can't discard because it may have come from Muhammad, so it's included. And that's not my pin here. Go to YouTube, open the channel for my friend here. And he gives you a grading. He says Sahih means like A plus. Hassan means A minus B plus. Daif is anywhere from C to D. So even though it's Hassan, according to one grading, but because there is a weakness in the chain, it's Daif. That still doesn't mean it's rejected. So when he puts up the article, you'll see it. Now, let me give you the background of this. Ibn Qayyim is mentioning... The views of scholars regarding the Torah. The question is, is the Torah corrupted? He goes, there are three views. He's going to mention, I give you the three views. He goes, one view says it's been corrupted. The second view says it's not corrupted and cannot be corrupted. And they give evidence. And the third view says there's only some minor changes, but it's basically preserved. And he goes, and that third view is the view of Ibn Taymiyyah. He gives three views. Now, notice the only view that gives evidence is the view that says the Torah cannot be corrupted. Now start reading for him, brother. See what evidences they quote. There are so three one party evidence. claimed that all or most of the Torah has been changed and it is not the same book which was revealed to Allah by uh, Allah to Moses. Their reason had to do with the variations of the text and the contradictions of some of its parts with the other parts to the point that the text now allows ablution with urine. <laughs> all right. Uh, anyway. Now, that's their argument, right? Because variations, even though the Quranic manuscripts have thousands of variations. Now, watch the second group. Does the second group give evidences? Let's read. On the other side, another party of Hadith and Fiqh scholars said, these changes took place during its interpretation and not during the process of, revel of its revelation. This is the view of Abi Abdullah, Muhammad bin Ishmael, Al-Bukhari. Al-Bukhari, who collected the hadith of Ibn Abbas, supposedly that the Torah has been corrupted. So Bukhari, I guess, didn't know what he's talking about because he quotes the hadith, which I heard you guys mention, that Abbas, Ibn Abbas supposedly says it's corrupted, but Bukhari says, no, the books of Allah cannot be corrupted. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Al-Bukhari, who said in his hadith collection, no one can corrupt the text by removing any of Allah's words from his books, but they corrupted it by misinterpreting it. Mm. Al-Razi also agrees with this opinion in his commentary. He said, there is a difference of opinions regarding this matter among some of the respectable scholars. Some of these scholars said the manuscript copies of the Torah were, distri were distributed everywhere, and no one knows the exact number of these copies. Now, let me explain his logic here. He's saying, since the copies of the Torah have spread all over the world, it is impossible for it to have been corrupted because no one person could collect all the copies and change them. Hmm. He says it right there. That's good. It is impossible to have a conspiracy to change or alter the word of God in all of these copies without missing any copy. Such a conspiracy will not be logical or possible. Did you hear that, Muslims? This is Razi, one of yours, not ours. But keep reading. And when Allah told his messenger to ask the Jews to bring their Torah and read it concerning the stoning command, they were not able to change this command from their copies. That is why they covered up the stoning verse while they were reading it to the prophet. It was then 
when Abdullah ibn Salam requested that they remove their hand so that the verse became clear. If they have changed or altered the Torah, then this verse would have been one of the important verses to be altered by the Jews. You see how reasonable Razi is? He's saying, man, if they were corrupting the Torah by removing verses, they would have removed this verse. But it shows you they didn't remove anything. They just hid what was in their books. Also, whenever the prophet would ask them concerning the prophecies about him in the Torah, they were not able to remove them either. Hmm. And they would respond by stating that they are not about him and they are still waiting for the prophet in now, the Torah. Before you read the hadith that your friend said it's weak, which is the other evidence they give, did you understand the reasoning of Razi? Well, these verses are still there in their copies. If they could, they would remove them. They didn't because they didn't remove verses. They just hid them, and there are too many copies for anyone to corrupt. Such a conspiracy theory is impossible. Thank you, Razi, for sounding reasonable. Okay, yeah. Now, here's the hadith that your Muslim said is da'if, Abu Dawood. All right. A group of Jewish people invited the messenger of Allah to a house. When he came, they asked him, Oh, Abu Qasim, one of our men committed adultery with a woman. What is your judgment against him? So they placed a pillow and asked the messenger of Allah to set on it. Then the messenger of Allah proceeded to say, Bring me the Torah, da'if. When they brought it, he, he removed the pillow from underneath him and placed the Torah on it and said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Then said, bring me one of you who have the most knowledge. So they brought him a young man who told him the story of the stone. Now, before you read, Ibn Qayyim is going to now say, this is one of the evidences the scholars used to do what? Read what he says. The scholars said, if the Torah was corrupted, he would not have placed it on the pillow, and he would not have said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. No, man, it's Da'if, because Mimi Hijab and Ali Drama said it's Da'if. What are you doing, man? And you guys think you're scholars? Shame on you. See, your Muslim friends, they're a joke. They're lying to you. But now it gets worse, because now they quote a Quranic verse that we quote to prove the Bible can't be corrupted. Look at the other evidence. This group of scholars also said, Allah said, and the word of your Lord has been accomplished truly and justly. There is none who can change his words. And he is hearing the hearing, the knowing. And the Torah is Allah's word. They just quoted chapter 6, verse 115, Avery. Yep. The one we okay. quote to show that none of the books of the Bible can be corrupted because they're the words of Allah. And the scholar said, yep, since the Torah is the word of Allah, and chapter 6, verse 115 says, Allah's words can't be corrupted, the Torah cannot be corrupted. Uh, well, one second. I'm going to leave you off with this last question because I got to go. Um, why is the Quran titled Al Furqan, like the criterion of uh, right and wrong? It was the Torah in chapter 2, verse 53. It says Moses was given Al Furqan, but the verse okay, the verse before uh, before it saying Al Furqan, it tells you that Allah revealed the Torah and the Injil, and then He revealed, yeah, but you didn't hear me. Mm -hmm. The Torah is also called Furqan, it's one of the names of the Torah. Wait, which verse? 53. So what are you trying to assume by that? That because it's the Fur uh, Torah criterion, that means it exposes corruption to the Bible? Well, the Torah is called Furqan. That means I can use the Torah to expose corruption to your Quran, if I use your logic. Okay. Exactly, yeah. Right. In fact, the verses that you quoted, Surah al Imran 3, 3 to 4, if you actually read in context, it says, confirming what is between his hands, meaning whatever he had at that time. The verb for confirm, sadaqa, means to bear witness and testify, to believe in the authenticity, integrity of something or someone. It's never used negatively. So whatever Furqan means, it doesn't mean that the Quran is going to expose corruption to the Bible. All right. Um, okay.